Yo, what is good, YouTube? Who is that guy is back for another one, a double drop today. And in this one, I'm talking about uh, continuing my Who Was series. Who was Timothy? In this video, we're going to be talking about who Timothy was because two books in the New Testament are actually directed to this brother named Timothy. So today, we're going to be talking about who this guy is and all these Bible facts about him and how he's actually a real great and tangible, practical example for all of us to follow, especially as young people. No, I'm saying so everybody, let's buckle in, but especially if you're young, I think there's some gems that we could take away as young people in the Lord. You know what I'm saying? So let's dive right into who was Timothy. Now, Timothy, whose name means honored by God in Greek, because it's Timothy, it's like Timotheos, uh, short into Timothy in English. His name means honored by God in Greek. He was born to a Hebrew mother and a Greek father. He was a minister in the New Testament of the early church, and he became a bishop, or some people would call a pastor, of the church in Ephesus. You see what I'm saying? So the Bible talks about overseers and deacons, and some people refer to the overseer as a bishop or in more Protestant, you know, American circles as a pastor. All right, but this leader in the church of Ephesus is what this brother would become, and he was actually a mixed race individual, as I touched on earlier. All right. So we start from the beginning. Timothy's born. He's born to a Greek father and a Hebrew mother. He eventually became super tight with the Apostle Paul, who we know was fully a Hebrew of Benjaminite descent. We can see in uh, Philippians 3, 5. OK, so we have a mixed race individual working with someone who's fully Hebrew, but they're working together to spread the gospel of God. I obviously know Jesus himself was a Hebrew. He was an Israelite, but the message went beyond the tribes of Israel to the nations. OK, and we're first introduced to Timothy in Acts chapter 16. All right. Starting in verse one, Paul came to a derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. So it's interesting little tidbits that we can extract from this verse that Paul was actually on his way to spread the decision that was reached by the Jerusalem elders last chapter in Acts 15. So they came to a decision. Paul and some other brothers are going on to deliver the message to some of the other believers in other churches. And along the way, he meets a local brother named Timothy, who was well spoken of by the people who are already there. And Paul, Paul, I think, sees something in Timothy that he wants him to ride with him. But because of his father being a Greek, Timothy was actually never circumcised, which we know was a practice that was given to the Hebrews um, in the law. So Paul actually goes and circumcises Timothy and goes on continuing his gospel spreading adventures with him because they knew that there were obviously Jews in these places and doing so would allow them to be a witness to them. So one thing I want to abstract here is we get to Timothy who actually gets circumcised as an adult male. But... Uh, instead of being seven or eight days old. But we can actually stop here to get principles of scripture. Because all we see again is the Apostle Paul using a strategic discernment about his audience to allow himself to be a witness to them, which are principles that we should follow based on the spirit of Matthew 10, 16. Uh, wise as serpents, innocent as doves. That's what the Apostle Paul is doing. Because when you're able to sort of adapt to your audience without compromising any scriptural truth, you're able to reach a lot more people. And this is the attitude of the early apostles. Also, all right, so when we take this as well as with Acts 21 and some other passages, we can see uh, how diplomatic the apostles were with the Israelites that still believed they were under the old covenant. So let me be very clear that the New Testament never teaches against any Old Testament commandment, uh, but it does teach that the new covenant has come in. The new covenant with the house of Judah, which is predicted, has been initiated through the Messiah, a.k.a. Jesus, and other people have been grafted into that family. Okay, so when we look at everything, we actually see how consistent the Old Testament is with the New Testament. If you lay everything on the table when it comes to matter of the law of God and things of that nature, but with people who still believe that they are under the old covenant, we can see how diplomatic the apostles were to those individuals. And to be a witness to them, a brother who was of Jewish descent, who wasn't circumcised, Paul actually had circumcised 
so that he could be a witness to them and they wouldn't be hard hearted because what are you talking about? You're not circumcised and you claim this heritage, which brings me to my next point before I dive on. I believe there, there's a little lesson here, especially if we take this, take, take the context of what's going on here and look at some of the freedom that brothers have based on Romans 14 and Colossians 2. I believe this gives us a framework where if someone is descended from the 12 tribes, either being of legitimate Jewish identity or Hebrew identity, there is a right that they have to want to have these Hebrew identity markers as a means to reflect their identity in the Messiah. Because that's what Paul is literally doing to Brother Timothy over here. He has him circumcised so that it's a way of embracing his Hebrew heritage so that other Hebrews will then listen to their message about Christ or Messiah. In terms of in terms of that aspect, that aspect of people who come to believe the gospel. Another thing that's interesting is that as a mixed race individual, he was accepted as a Hebrew, as a Jew in this community, at least after he tapped into that community, uh, tapped into that identity, because that was the whole point of getting circumcised. OK, and the message of the gospel is very Hebraic in origin in terms of the culture that it would come from. Right. We could look at the Sabbath controversies that Christ would deal with the type of thinking that ancient Hebrews had them that reflected in the New Testament as a means to shine the light of Christ. All this is to say the uh, the origins of the gospel are very Hebraic, and we can see how that 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 was a blessing to let the other tribes know that the Messiah had come. Now, 2 Timothy, moving on, gives us a little bit about his family life. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, he says, Paul to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So now we actually get a couple of name drops of Timothy's family, not only his uh, mother, who we talked about before, her name is actually Eunice, but his grandmother as well, Louise. So I just think it's it's it's, it's awesome when I study the scriptures and see how certain people some of the first believers are actually name dropped and their names are just cemented in history. Even though we never met these women before, we know their names of, of this brother who would have such an impact. So I love looking at stuff like that. But 2 Timothy 3, 14, we see uh, Paul says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. So even though Timothy was Hellenized, which I think is suggested by his name, by having a Greek name that honors the God of Israel, you know what I'm saying? Hellenized being, you know, people, some Jews who are a little more influenced by the Greek culture. His father was a Greek man. Even though it seemed like he had this, he had this mixed upbringing, he was thoroughly acquainted with the Hebrew scriptures, with the revelations of God. Call a spade a spade from this community of people that we can look at archaeology and have corn rolls. Uh, on archaeological reliefs who worship their God. This revelation, these scriptures, and he grew up He grew up in this household, and so it prepared him to uh, accept the Messiah who tasted life after death when it was preached to him. So after this, after hearing about the Messiah, which he was ready to accept, after, for, after, studying, after knowing the scriptures, he actually joined the movement of the first apostles. And from that point, we can see that uh, Brother Timothy was a, a, a great friend and the right hand man of the Apostle Paul. You see, that it's like the two are, are, are inseparable. I'm saying the two are very tight. And we can actually see that Timothy is actually the co-author of many of the books in the New Testament that we ain't even normally pick up on. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. That's two references. 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, 2 Thessalonians is like 1 Thessalonians almost verbatim. So that's another name drop of Timothy with the apostle Paul. Uh, Philemon uh, chapter 1, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. And then finally, the book of Philippians, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So if I ain't tripping, that six uh, fingers raised, I mean six times, uh, the brother Timothy is, is alongside the apostle Paul in some of the messianic writings of the New Testament. 
which is a beautiful thing to see. It reflects how close Timothy would have been with the Apostle Paul when they were journeying together and spending the gospel and things of that nature. Because if we actually uh, continue on in Philippians 2, we get this beautiful little section starting at verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheerful by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that surely I myself will come also. So Timothy, we can see from this passage, even though we never met him, from the scriptures, we can see that he was a genuine soul. He cared for others. He was like a diamond in a rock pit. He was one in a million. His light shined. And Paul himself says that I have seen no one like him. So just think, Paul's going on these other journeys. He's getting all these people to come believe in the true God through Christ, through the proclamation of the Messiah. The gospel is spreading across the world. You got to think about all these other people that are now coming into the fold. And yet Paul says, I have no one like Timothy. That means a lot. And the way he says, uh, just have, as you know, in verse 22, like y'all know, it shows that the church also recognized the, the beauty that Timothy was. Now, we even see that Timothy is even called God's co-worker, the most highest co-worker. And 1 Thessalonians 3, 2 by the Apostle Paul. And that shows the level of respect that the Apostle Paul had for this brother. And it shows us that if the Apostle Paul had such a high regard for Timothy, then the church in general probably did as well. A little bit down in the New Testament, and we can see the author of the book of Hebrews knew Timothy as well. Hebrews 13, 23. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, whom I shall see you if he comes soon. So not only does this mean that, number one, the author of Hebrews was in the apostolic circle, knew brothers like Timothy, who by extent very likely knew the Apostle Paul if Paul himself didn't write Hebrews. But number two, it also shows us that Timothy was in some sort of imprisonment because now he's getting released in this verse. He's told to the brothers, he's telling the brothers that Timothy is about to be released. So what I think is very likely is that Timothy was probably imprisoned for his faith in the same way the Apostle Paul was. Which goes to show how much the early church uh, was suffering because of the proclamation of Christ and were dealing with people who were firsthand uh, uh, in the movement, firsthand apostles who were going through some of these things as well. Now we'll finish with the book of 1 Timothy where we could actually learn a little bit more about uh, his 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 uh, testimony and his sort of maturation into becoming a church leader. 1 Timothy 1.18 this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. cross reference with chapter 4, the 14th verse, Paul says, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Timothy, who we know accompanied the apostle Paul, had elders lay hands on him, and a word of prophecy was actually spoken over this brother's life. And then we can see him sort of walk into that role over the pages of scripture when it becomes a bishop at the church of Ephesus. So we sort of see him mature and walk into this role um, that God told him he would go into beforehand. And we see him teaching from the scriptures, which would primarily be the Old Testament and teaching the people the truths of Christ. I personally relate to Timothy in several ways. Number one, I, I really don't like to talk about myself or get my you know what I'm saying? Give my testimony. But the whole thing about having prophecy spoken over your life is something that I can personally attest to and vindicate. People speaking things over my life um, before I had any zeal for God that have come to pass within the last couple of years. Other people say the same thing without even planning on saying it. I've had, you know, my, my preacher in Florida stop mid-sermon and make this proclamation that is consistent with what the other uh, uh, um, elder had told me beforehand, before I even moved. So there's these these subtle things where people in my life are saying the same thing over me um, in regards to my calling and things like that. And I've tested it against scripture. I've asked other people uh, to weigh prophecies because the Bible mentions that as well. Um, and 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 it's fully been consistent and it's and it's been you know been maturing and fulfilling in my own life. So 
I just think I'm just going to say that, you know, one time and one time only, probably, unless I make a video about my testimony. You know what I'm saying? Just I can relate to this, brother, on a, on a personal level. So respect to Timothy. Um, another thing is that Timothy was young, so he was a role model to the young people. So let, let us look uh, at Timothy for a model of excellence, you know, outside of Christ himself. 1 Timothy 1.12, let no one despise you for your youth. But set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Now I researched this a little bit, and it seems that by the time this would have been written, around AD 62 or 64, Timothy probably would have been late 20s or early 30s, which also means by the time he first started rocking with Paul, he probably would have been late teens or early 20s. This is looking at some of the estimated dates that was on gotquestions.org, one resource, I'll link that in the description. But for all intents and purposes, Timothy was a young man. You know what I'm saying? He was young, you know, he was real young, but then he was a young man when he became a church leader. And we don't even know if he was married or not. Because y'all know, y'all know how some church folk can be. You know what I'm saying? When you when you got this you, you role and you ain't got no wife and you're a young man, it's not necessarily a good look. We don't even know if he had a wife or not. But we can see him mature with this con that was given straight from God. And when it's given from God, who cares what man has to say? You know what I'm saying? But obviously you have to respect your elders and listen to your elders. So we got to have a balanced perspective about what it means to be called as young people. Let me say this is a great encouragement for young people in the Lord, in the most high. Don't be discouraged by older people, you know, who may who may look down on you because of your age, because that's not coming from 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 a, a biblical spirit. Now, if the criticism is coming from a biblical spirit, it's a legitimate criticism. Maybe you're studying the scriptures and you're wrong about something. You need to be open to correction. Or maybe you're wilding out as a child of God doing what ought not to be done and you're getting rebuked for it. In that situation, I'm with the elder. In that situation, I'm with the old head. You know what I'm saying? Because we got to be respectful to our elders, submitted to our elders, both in our, you know, the community and the church. Obviously, there's nuances and caveats. Obviously, you know, that they, they have to be yoked to as well. We're not saying it's a dictatorship, but it's just common respect. And if they have a legitimate criticism as a young person, you got to listen to it. But at the same time, don't let no one discourage you when you have a calling from the Most High because it's from the Most High. Look up Timothy as an example. You know what I'm saying? God just used children, young prophets, and young ministers in both Testaments to give messages to adults that would both receive it and adults that would be hard-hearted to it. So the only thing we have to do is ask, actually spend time, intentional time to pray, to figure out um, if what we think the Lord is calling us is really what he's calling us to. So that takes intentionality, that takes intentional prayer to, to make sure we're going down the path that we believe God is leading us down, all right? So when you're confident in that and you know and you know and you know, then you're on a relationship with the Most High, you're in a pretty good place. Okay, so if someone's coming at you from a bad spirit when it comes to the things of God or what you're doing based on your age, just meditate on these scriptures. You know what I'm saying? And go forward in a spirit of love and a spirit of respect and in a spirit of knowing your worth, basically. The thing I want to say simply, you can be right in your elder wrong. We're all human. You know what I'm saying? So with a matter of morality or a matter of understanding scriptures, you can totally be right and your elder can be wrong, too. You should navigate that situation with integrity and with respect and with care. Um, but, you know what I'm saying? God used young prophets to chastise kings and leaders and adults who are moving wrongly. Okay? So don't get discouraged that just by, by your youth, you can't understand the scriptures. Because even from the scriptures itself, we can see that when we're honest and when we study them, you can uh, uh, understand the truth of scripture on your own. When we study places like Acts 15, okay? So just be encouraged if 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 you're in your relationship with the Lord, all right? Let's look at Timothy, uh, brother, as an example of that. So that concludes this episode. And why did I make this out of respect for Timothy? Because I was studying the book of Timothy, and I got a lot of respect for this brother. So I wanted to make a little uh, video to give him the respect that he deserves as a man of God. And it seems like he's one of the realest people that the world has ever known, if the scripture if the words of scripture mean anything. So let's replicate him. Let's replicate the genuineness of his faith, his genuine care for others. And it makes it a little bit more realistic and tangible because we know Jesus was sinless. 
Now we're getting someone who was a sinner, who needed God's grace, but his, but his example of conduct is something that, that's, that's a little easier to replicate because he was a sinner just like us. You get what I'm saying? So let's replicate, let's replicate uh, the qualities that are praised of this brother in the scriptures. To that extent, let us keep in mind Revelation 3.16 to avoid being lukewarm, all right? Let's, let's leave that lukewarm stuff behind and be on fire for God. Purification starts at the household of God. So that being said, y'all in the global family of God and the Messiah be blessed. And I'll see y'all in the next video, all right? Peace.